makes this theater not just radiate, but rock. Woo! Like a great dress, the Ebel becomes you. <laughs> we are all making history tonight. And I've been asked to tell you about this historic institution, which this evening celebrates fabulous women. Present company included. Uh. <laughs> when you came through those doors, you stepped into a national monument, an American treasure, the Ebel of Los Angeles, once known as the largest women's club in the world, but very much a place for today's woman. And although she is a woman of a certain age, the Ebel has good bones. She doesn't need major refreshment. <laughs> now there's a lot of history here. Queen Marie of Romania visited and broke the law here. She smoked illegally in our French room. <laughs> Amelia Earhart made her last public speaking appearance here before she flew off into the ether. Judy Garland was discovered on this stage. And under a hot light, Beyonce's undulations caused eyeballs to pop and sweat to run. <laughs> but it wasn't always like this. 116 years ago, Grover Cleveland was president, Queen Victoria ruled England, and Russia's last czar was Nicholas II. The Eat Bell Club was born that year. It wasn't an easy time for women. It was 26 years before suffrage. Now you're supposed to hiss. <laughs> Bodies were hobbled by long dresses and deformed by horses. But minds were open. Two sisters here in Los Angeles organized a group in their home to explore the rapidly changing world. This potent idea became the Ebel Club, a place for them to be, a place for them to empower themselves, a place to throw off the chains, a place to take off the blinders, a place to think for themselves, to control their lives, to make life better, to get on bikes in their bloomers, and zoom off into Shakespeare, psychology, law, browning, and citizenship. They invited their friends. They outgrew the house. They rented a space with their own money. They outgrew that. They bought a space with their own money. They outgrew that. They built a space with, with their, their own, own money. money. <laughs> the Los Angeles Times called it a modified Greek temple. They got it right. There were a lot of Athenians there, strong, brave, wise women who could do anything with their own money. money. <laughs> they moved four times with their own with their money. Own money. Finally, they outgrew a gorgeous structure on 7th and Figueroa with $500,000 of their own money. They purchased what had been a field of Gretlin orange groves on an undeveloped road. Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> Some vision, huh? They hired one of the great architects of the day, Sumner Hunt, who just happened to have been married to an email president. So there was a lot of pillow talk. The women got risers on their stairs that made them ascend and descend like queens. They got a coffered ceiling, a grilled work door, an enchanted garden, a woman's statue in a fountain dedicated to peace in honor of their husbands, brothers, and sons lost in World War I. And they got this spectacular, spectacular theater with its soaring windows. When this building opened in 1927, in the middle of Prohibition, and two years before the stock market crash, there was jazz dancing, fast cars, talk about Freud, and the shortest dresses in history. <laughs> if there was gin, they didn't document it. They retained the woman president who was their leader for two terms, calling her the building president. They ignored the crash. They didn't talk about it. They moved forward. The Depression didn't defeat them. It made them stronger and the club grew. They were remarkable, those email ladies. Nothing stopped them. Their determination bolted right out there through their model. I will find a way or make one. They kept moving, establishing scholarship endowments, 
women's aid endowments, assisting homeless, battered, abandoned women, even back then. Then in the 60s, disco in, everything changed. Some club members embraced new opportunities outside these walls. Then he left. A small number remained. The property was almost sold. This whole big complex run all those years by 15 women on board. But the spirit of those early founders joined with the spirit of the flower children and new doors opened. There was too much that resembled greatness in this incredible space that they and therefore mothers had carved up with their own with their money. money. They reevaluated their assets. They rented their facility for film shoots, weddings, and political events. The club experienced a rebirth. The daughters and granddaughters of its founders understood deep within their bones that this good, shining, alabaster caravansari slanted on a corner of Wilshire Boulevard could not be lost. The Ebel women have always been leaders and ahead of their time. They made a decision to harvest the talents of all women, not just women like themselves. And this club became one of the most diversified in modern times. Now we're coming here today, here we are, hosting a grand night for some grand women and men too. <laughs> we know where they came from. We know how they got here. We have tired feet and broken fingernails to prove it. <laughs> and so we not only welcome you tonight, we celebrate all the women who made it this far. Let the circle go unbroken. By and by, Lord. By and by. Keep on going. The road may be hard. The hill may be steep. The light may be low, but at the end, at the end, there is triumph. And all of you, too, will find a way or make one. Thank you, especially Mrs. Obama, for making history here. Thank you very much.